The guys go, dude, I train martial arts just for the streets. Or, my martial art has to work on the streets. Typically, not always, but typically, they're forever trying to eye gouge their way out of the bottom of mount. Or they think if they're going against a boxer who's got way better hands than they do, that they can just kick the guy in the shins and the guy will magically drop. Or there are guys who have super secret knife techniques that involve the other guy going like this with a knife. And then you cut here, you cut this artery, you cut this tendon, you cut this muscle, you take out this organ, you do this, and you, you know, do this long, essentially, kata on how to dismember somebody. So typically, these guys who train just for self-defense, and every technique is geared towards being street lethal and street ready and combat ready, they're not actually doing a very good job of it at all. And here's why. To have an excellent deadly martial art, first you need an excellent safe martial art. That may sound like a contradiction, but here's what I'm talking about. The safe part of a martial art, relatively safe, is the boxing, is the kicking, the kickboxing, is the grappling, is the fencing with blunt weapons. The delivery mechanism is a fairly safe way to train something against resistance. It's a way that you can train with a training partner and have them give you resistance and have them give you pressure and have them try to stop your techniques and do the same back to you, which is otherwise known as sparring or some form of sparring. And that creates a really efficient delivery mechanism. The analogy I always use here is Mike Tyson. How many times in his training did Mike Tyson ever practice closing the distance and biting the ear? I guarantee you zero. I guarantee you that they never actually drilled this on the focus mitts or had a little fake ear that he could come in and bite. The delivery mechanism though is the footwork, is to be able to come in against punches, is able to be able to get close to your opponent. And then, so that's like the, uh, the rail car that brings your weapon in. Then firing the weapon, whether it's a left hook, whether it's an uppercut, whether it's a bite, whether it's an eye gouge, that's secondary. Trouble is, you can't train at full force with full resistance against somebody who's trying to do that to you. If we had a system based on the eye gouge, we can't actually train that very hard against very much resistance. At some point, it'll end up being cooperative. Whoa, you've got the thumbs in my eyes. I gotta stop. And you don't get a true assessment of the power of it. You're much better off training the delivery system reasonably safely with kickboxing, with jujitsu, with wrestling, with a blunt weapon sparring system, and then adding on the super deadly techniques at the end. Daniele Bolelli, a friend of mine, mentioned this to me, and I think he's right, that if your only goal is combat, right? Street ready, combat, lethal stuff, great. You should still spend 80% of your time, 90% of your time practicing martial sport and then sprinkle in the 10, the 20% of the stuff that's impossible to train. Because to go back to a kickboxing context, if you're kickboxing, you're sparring with big padded gloves and maybe headgear and maybe mouth guards and agreed upon rules like no punching the guy in the balls, that's all cool. Then it's easy to go and add in the eye gouge. Then it's easy to go in and add in the headbutt. Boxers do it all the time. Now, it's true that if you only do martial sport, if that's the only thing that you do, and you go deep down into the kickboxing well, that you might develop myopia for, quote, the deadlier techniques. The extreme example of this would be getting in a fight, you know, bringing your fists up, and then wanting to tap gloves, ready to go. That would obviously be bad, or it's been caricatured. <laughs> you know, a judo guy comes up and he bows, and as he bows, the other guy gets kicks him in the face. I think it was in a James Bond movie years and years ago. Okay, so that guy is so trapped in the rabbit hole of his martial art and the martial art traditions and what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do that he's not an effective combat person. It should be something where you're trying to do something to someone else and they're trying to stop you. It's contested. The other guy's not trying to let you do it to them. It should be within rules for safety, so that you can develop the attributes, the timing, the distancing, the body positioning, the resistance to pressure, the learning to deal 
with an onslaught of attacks. And then add in a little bit of extra. Doesn't mean that you need to go on balls to the wall sparring every single time. Doesn't mean that you actually need to compete because it's not acknowledged enough that just wrestling in class or doing light boxing with somebody is a form of competition. If you're a seasoned competitor, you might not get a big adrenaline rush going in another local tournament. Oh yeah, another day in the office. But to somebody brand new, they might get a giant rush from sparring for the first time, the second time, the third time. Sparring with that guy that they know is better than them and just trying to survive. They're going to get a huge amount of benefit of that. They're competing in a relatively safe setting against a sparring partner, but it's still competition. A couple more analogies just to beat this point into the ground. Imagine you're a 16th century gentleman living in Florence. And you walk around, you carry a rapier, and you go into a, a fencing hall where you're going to learn how to fence. And the fencing master says, okay, so you take this and you're going to pair up with Luigi there, and you're going to practice your basic parry and thrust. Eh, pretty normal. And you go, well, no, 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 Monsieur Le, Ma Le Mestre. Uh, I only train for the streets, therefore I will use my sharp sword to do this drilling with a partner. You think anybody would actually train with you? Hell no. <laughs> you screw up one time, that epe is going, or that rapier is going right through your training partner. Of course, you're going to train with a blunt sword. Boxing is essentially learning to fence with a blunted rapier, with a blunted epe, with a blunted foil. You've got your jab, you've got your cross, you've got your hook. You get really good at those. Then, later, if you really, really need to, you add in the eye, you know, the eye gouge, the throat grab, the ear slap, the whatever the magic technique of your martial art is. Or you just hit them with the right fist, which has been developed and knocks the guy out because that's actually a proven technique, but that's a whole nother rant. Another example would be somebody who's like a musician, musician, guitarist, and he only wants to perform in concerts. So he doesn't jam. He doesn't jam with the guys in the band. He's like, no, no, no. I only train for, I want to do concerts. I only train for concerts. Therefore, I can only do concerts. Come on. You are going to train with the band hours and hours and hours, a hundred times more training than actually performing in concerts. Building that base is crazy important. The dirty techniques, if you have to use them, are the icing on the cake. They're the icing on the cake. They're not the cake itself. The cake itself is the reasonably safe martial art that you've been training the boxing, the kickboxing, the clinching, the wrestling, the groundwork, the fighting, the sparring with sticks, the fighting, the sparring with blunted epées, and keeping an eye out. If your focus is street self-defense, keeping an eye out for the dirty techniques. A world-class fencer probably would have done all right in Florence if he had learned a couple of techniques. Oh, well, super dirty technique number one, you take a bunch of coins out of your pocket, you throw it in the guy's eyes, and then you stab him. Great, we don't have to practice that 100,000 times. We have to be aware of it, maybe practice it a couple of times, and we're good. Dirty technique number two, you take your cloak and you whirl it around the guy's epee, and then you stab him. Great, that's a valid technique. That might need to be drilled a few times. I'm 100% down with that. But the majority of your time is going to be spent you know, parrying and thrusting, training in a safe environment, developing your delivery system. The dirty techniques are the icing on the cake. They're not the cake itself. That's your safe, sportive martial art that you can train safely, reasonably safely, with a training partner, with a friend, and maybe even in competition, we can go and get some real world experience of real world pressure without a huge chance of injury. All right. If you're wondering who I am and you watch this far and why I'm allowed to have an opinion on this, I've been doing martial arts for 36 years. My name is Stefan Kesting. I run self-defense tutorials. I run grapplearts.com. I'm all over Instagram. I'm over all over Twitter. I'm on Facebook. You can scout me there. You can stalk me there. You can say mean things about me there. And you can find out about my credentials and the martial arts that I've trained in and the type of training that I've been involved in in those venues. Also, if you're a grappler, 
go check out the Grapple Arts BJJ Master App. The Grapple Arts BJJ Master App has more than 457 minutes of free techniques. The, the app is free to download for Android, for iOS. Go grab it, search for it in the uh, Google Play Store, search for it in the iTunes Store. It's a really good platform. You can add more modules to it if you like, but even the basic free version comes with a ton of material, a ton of black belt instruction. All right, take care, and I'll see you on the mats another day.